bumps. I'm up to the big time now. That's right. We're big timing. All right. Let's see. I think we may be live, Daryl. Good morning. It's good to see you, bud. Good morning, Bernard. I uh, want to welcome everybody to another episode of Nomberg Law Live. As we do every Tuesday, we come to you at 10 a.m. Central, 8 a.m. Pacific, and talking to buddies of mine around the country, lawyers, non-lawyers, professionals, all people who've got something interesting to share with us. And I've got my buddy, Daryl Dixon from Paducah, Kentucky. Good morning, Daryl, and I appreciate you, you sharing some time with us today. Good morning, Bernard. Man, I've been, been looking forward to this for a long time. I'm getting called up to the big leagues. <laughs> Nomberg Live, let's go. All right, well, today, uh, Daryl and I are going to talk about an area of the law that he specializes in, and that's traumatic brain injury cases. And before we get into the specifics about that, and Daryl's so well educated in this area, and that's why I've got him on today, is we're going to, uh, I want Daryl, I want you to introduce yourself a little bit. Despite the fact of our collegiate allegiances <laughs> co collide so often, we're going to put that aside for today and let you <laughs> and let you talk to the folks. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Daryl. Well, I love it how you're wearing your Vandy tie today, and I'm wearing my UK tie. So there's never there's never a down <laughs> moment between the two of us. And That's I guess right. everybody needs to know that. <laughs> um, I, I get texts from Bernard when uh, Vanderbilt's beating Kentucky in uh, you know a real relevant sport like baseball, but uh, I don't hear much from him during football and basketball season. Uh, no, but anyway, uh, we have a lot of fun going back and forth and um, Bernard being a star college athlete and me being a star college wannabe athlete uh, that never materialized. But my name is Daryl T. Dixon and I'm a personal injury, traumatic brain injury lawyer from Paducah, Kentucky. And I've been practicing for about 20 years. Um, I just joined a new firm, a national firm, Morgan & Morgan the largest plaintiff's firm in the country. And I did so after uh, running my own practice for a little over 19 years. So uh, very happy to be here, very, very happy to be part of a, a, a larger team. And, uh, and it's, it's been a, a great first couple of months getting going and uh, doing what I love. Well, Daryl, you and I first met each other uh, really through the efforts of Mitch Jackson, who just came on board with us on the show. Good morning, Mitch. We appreciate you. Morning, Mitch. With us. Uh, we first met a couple of years ago through the Legal Minds Masterminds that Mitch runs and developed our friendship over the last couple of years. And we're fortunate to spend some time last year at Max Law uh, Conference in St. Louis. And I've gotten to know that your practice really focuses on a very unique uh, area of the law that's pretty complex, and that's traumatic brain injuries. And I know you do such a great job for your clients, and I, I see that in your social media and, and our communications. But before we dig really, really deep into this, I want you to just share with us what is a traumatic brain injury, and what are the most common types of um, events or accidents that cause those traumatic brain injuries, otherwise known as TBIs? Well, traumatic brain injury, it, it, it always fascinated me because I always uh, I wanted to study study parts. I wanted to know what made people tick. And uh, so that got me so interested in studying the brain and, and the decision-making process that indi individuals make and why do, why do people make the decisions they make and do the things they do. And then as being a lawyer and being a personal injury lawyer, I came to... Uh, basically stumble in some of these cases by chance. And uh, it, it, to me, it was a very challenging area of the law and one that, uh, you know, you don't really learn this stuff in, in, in law school. If you don't go out and educate yourself with, you know, two, three, four, five seminars a year and all the reading and studying and, uh, you know, mentoring from other people, you don't really learn about traumatic brain injury. But uh, traumatic brain injury affects about a million, a little over a million people a year in the United States. And um, it, it, it's, it, the, the, the severities range from, uh, from mild, which is going to be the, the, the most, most of the cases you, you know, probably 80 or 90 percent of the cases you have are going to be mild cases. And then there's some moderate and then there's some even severe cases of brain injury. 
So it, they're, they're, they're really all over the map. Like I said, there's a little over a million of them a year. And, um, and that's kind of a brief history of how I got started, uh, you know, representing clients who had suffered. Oh, I think you asked me, uh, what are the most common causes? And I think that the very most common causes, over 50% is going to be falls. And that's falls in the elderly, that's falls in uh, even infants, uh, well, not infants, but toddler stage. Um, and so that's going to be a little more than half. And then there's such things as car wrecks, um, sports injuries, um, and, and, and sometimes, you know, even gunshot. Uh, wounds play a play a large role in traumatic brain injury. Some criminal stuff mixed in there, and th those are the bulk of your traumatic brain injury causes. Well, Daryl, let, let's focus for a minute or two uh, on your practice and the types of okay. cases your your most recent or most commonly that you deal with. And I realize that we could we could dig deep and talk for several hours, but I want to kind of give a, a broad stroke of your practice and the types of cases that you concentrate on, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Uh, right now, since I've made the move to Morgan & Morgan, it's just limited to premises liability, uh, auto and semi-truck wrecks, and, and some nursing home cases. I have, uh, believe it or not, several nursing home cases, uh, active nursing home cases, where the uh, real edge of traumatic brain injury that causes serious injury and even sometimes wrongful death. And so I it's a very falls, special. Hmm? I was going to say, I guess falls in a nursing home are, are fairly common um, if they're not, if the patient or the, the the resident is not properly administered to or watched. Sure. And there's extra precautions taken uh, when someone's a fall risk. There's there's a lot more monitoring, a lot more paperwork that goes on with with making sure that there's extra checks done on them. Uh, their beds are at specific heights. They're in specific positions, um, you know, uh, whether the patient be ambulatory or not. Uh, they, they sometimes put them closer to the restroom, depending on age. And so there's just a lot of factors that go into fall pre prevention. And that's uh, really that's our number one concern when it comes to the premises cases and the, and the nursing home cases. Well, it's, Mitch brings up a good point, and that was leading to my next uh, topic is, how are people diagnosed with TBIs? Because I've handled a few cases in, in my own uh, practice and the, the loved ones of the client will say something along the lines, well, she just doesn't act the way she used to, she forgets. There's other things about her personality that just aren't there. So talk about that a little bit, Daryl. Let's use the nursing home experience or the nursing home situation uh, from that, because a lot of times I'm going to assume, and maybe this is incorrect on my part, is it's not well documented that the person actually fell because at the resident where they're staying, they don't want to necessarily come out and admit, hey, we did something wrong. Sure, sure. Um, back in 2013, the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, and the World Health Organization basically did away with the term concussion. You know, and I know you growing up playing football and myself playing soccer and basketball, we saw more than our share of concussions or he got his bell rung type type injuries. So they, they went ahead and did away with that injury so that they could start classifying everything as, in, in terms of traumatic brain injury. So a concussion now is considered a traumatic brain injury. And then the severity of the concussion will let you know whether it's mild, moderate or severe. Um, as far as being diagnosed with one, there's, there's several different indicators and, uh, and you can pretty much get neurologists, all kinds of neuropsychologists, all kinds of health professionals to agree with you that, you know, if you, if you, if you've suffered a concussion, you're at least to the first stage of mild traumatic brain injury. And I think we said earlier, those are 80 or 90%. And with a mild traumatic brain injury. Uh, that you've seen with concussions and things like that, we expect those to get better in six to 18 months. And the ones that don't, which is probably the 10 to 20%, we call those the miserable minority. And uh, those are the ones who are gonna have permanent injuries, who are gonna have symptoms that last, you know, years, and even can then, you know, uh, enhance Parkinson's disease, dementia, Alzheimer's, and, 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 and other 
injuries and, and basically shorten the lifespan. So um, now th the easiest way when we talk about subjective versus objective injuries uh, is it for it to be diagnosed on an MRI brain scan or a CAT scan. But we, we know from the literature that 95% uh, of the time when somebody comes in to a, uh, into an emergency room and they're complaining of you know, possible loss of conscious or I hit my head, they're gonna do a CAT scan and the CAT scan's gonna come back negative. And, and so we, we, we can't stop there. All a CAT scan can show you is, is there a fracture in the skull or is there a bleed or a hemorrhage in the brain? So we can't, you know, and a lot of a lot of people, I think the latest literature is, you know, traumatic brain injury is misdiagnosed 55% of the time, which is just an astonishing number. Um, because the purpose of an emergency room is to treat and release, to, to treat, stabilize, and release. You know, and if you have any further problems, you go to your primary care provider. And that just opens up a whole new can of worms for people who have, you know, basically had their bell rung, uh, and then they have to basically monitor their own treatment. Well, Darrell, we've got a bunch of folks who are now watching us. We've got some of our sure. buddies from Legal Minds. Carol's there, Tamara is here, my buddy William White, one of my former football coaches, Coach Andrews, oh, Carol wow. Wright, a, a high school uh, chum uh, who I grew up with. A bunch of folks are on here, and I've got I've got some comments and some questions to share with sure. you. Michelle asks, are there different levels, and I think you are headed toward this, are there different levels of severity for TBIs? I think that'd be a great thing for you to, to address. Absolutely. And like we said, if it's, if it's just your normal concussion, no lock, loss of consciousness, you're going to be more in the moderate range. The, I mean, excuse me, the mild range, which is, you know, it's a little M and a capital TBI. And that as we talked about, took the place of the term concussion. So uh, it's still easy to say concussion. It's easier to say concussion than, oh my gosh, you know, he, you know, can you imagine the announcer on the football game saying, well, it looks like he's got a mild traumatic brain injury. Right, um, but, right. That, but anyway, that so that's an alarm. <laughs> yeah, the, the, those are the, the, the bulk of the brain injuries. And then the moderate, the moderate's gonna be typically some loss of consciousness and then the uh, the severe is going to be the ones you know where there's like uh, something driven through the skull, uh, a massive brain, or or possibly a coma. Mm -hmm. And so those the moderate and the severe are the easy type because they're easy to uh, to to diagnose. They're easy to see those symptoms. The mild type is is the very hardest injury in all of personal injury, I think, because you can't. You can't see it. People look normal. Well, that's the just sharing back with one of my uh, experience. One of my cases is Daryl. We had a 12 year old girl who was in a bad car accident and mm -hmm. you couldn't see anything on the scans that you were referring to. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it was a change in personality, forgetfulness and those kind of things that the family noticed. Ultimately, she got to a uh, neurologist, neuropsychologist, and a whole team. And ultimately they said it takes at least for her type, and, and, and forgive me, this is not the clinical term, but it was, it, was a un, it was an unseen brain injury in that there was nothing physical you could see. It was all her short-term memory was wiped out, those kind of things. And the professionals were telling the family, that it takes at least a year from diagnosis for things to settle down to know what permanency that you have. And that's what I was gonna ask you is, tell us about what type of professionals typically are involved in diagnosing, treating, and giving opinions about the type or the level of TBI that they're dealing with. Well, it, like we discussed earlier, the first person they're gonna see is the, the ER physician. And uh, I, I would say with the, the, the new awareness of traumatic brain injury that, that, the, that there's an increased heightened alert uh, with head injuries or when you hear loss of consciousness or he hit his head, she hit his head, hit her head. Um, so I think it starts there. They're gonna be the gatekeeper. And a lot of times they're gonna refer you back to your primary care provider. And so 
with in this day, you know, with the NFL lawsuits and everything going around about traumatic brain injury, that like there is a heightened sensitivity. So I think primary care providers are probably learning more about this as well. And then uh, the person who's going to be the best at diagnosis is going to be like a neurologist or a neurosurgeon, and uh, they're going to have the most um, experience. Uh, you know, a, a radiologist, a neuroradiologist can certainly look at a brain scan and see if you have, uh, you know, or a CAT scan and see if there's there's bleeding. Uh, the MRI, they can tell whether there's lesions in that white matter tissue um, and that. So it's it's really, when it's the study, it's the study of, of the four lobes of the brain. It's the study of uh, of something called axons and neurons and dendrites and neurotransmitters, and it's just, uh, it's, it's very neat to, to, to study. It's, uh, uh, but even, it, it's even more satisfying and challenging to be able to represent someone with those type injuries because they're going through something that they didn't ask for, and they're going through something, and it's just, it's not something that they can just take an automatic pill or, or have a cast for six months or a, a physical therapy regimen, a lot of times they're damaged and they're damaged for, for, you know, it's a forever injury, we like to say sometimes. Daryl, I want to pause for just a minute. I appreciate your, your information expertise thus far. For those of you who have just joined us, or we'll be checking in later on. I'm with Daryl Dixon. Daryl is an attorney in Paducah, Kentucky, who specializes in handling cases that involve uh, folks who've been injured and have traumatic brain injuries. We're talking with Daryl about the different types of professionals who treat this. We're going to move in into a minute. I've got two two questions I want to throw to you from the, the audience, but we're going to move in in a minute about treatments and how families deal with these issues. But before we get there, Daryl, uh, Carol Williams asks, what happens if a TBI is diagnosed post-settlement? I bet that can create some real problems for everybody involved. That, that's, and first of all, hello, Carol. Um, haven't seen you in a while, talked to you in a while. Um, that, that's like the worst case scenario is to, uh, is to figure out that. And, and un unlike a broken bone or, um, or a, you know, a back injury, a neck injury, whatever, brain injuries are so much harder to, to uh, diagnose. And a lot of times, you know, as I said earlier, they don't teach this stuff in law school. And I know that when I was a young lawyer, there were probably cases that came through my office where there could have been a mild traumatic brain injury that, that, that you know, went unnoticed because there wasn't the heightened alert. There wasn't, um, you know, all the information that we have now out there. And so that's why we try to do things like we're doing today to educate more people, more lawyers, more doctors, families, um, any influencers, you know, to check for that. And that's why we're so careful uh, with our kids and everything when they get into sports, um, sports and, and falls and everything else. And our elderly, you know, our most prized possessions uh, are elder, elderly and, and making things safer for them uh, because they're going to be at the end of their lives in a weakened state and more susceptible than they were, you know, since they were uh, toddlers. Yeah, and you bring up a good point about sports and youth. Tamara is our, our, our next question is, as someone who's played football, what do you think about the new concussion protocol for the NFL, college sports and high school athletic programs? Are these entities potentially civilly liable for not following the protocol? And I think that's a great question. With with Daryl, I don't know if you've handled, I haven't handled any of these types of cases with these athletes, but I've read a ton and I know we're really in the infancy about the protocols sure. and the, the science. Sure. And I know the NFL has done, at least it appears they've put all this money in science, and I know that's a big controversy that we don't have to get into today. But I guess the question she's asking is, do you think there's potentially any civil liability for not following protocols that get put into place? I, I definitely think there is. Um, you know, one of the one seminar I went to last year, just to show you how heightened the, the alert is, you know, the NFL has 
you know, had a class action lawsuit that they settled and most of the players in that settlement were not happy with the, with, with the terms and the, and the amount of money given because, you know, there are lives just truly destroyed. Uh, you know, and I, I love football as much as the next guy, but, but the danger is there. And, you know, I've been to seminars where they, you know, one of the speakers would be talking about, you know, the new safety measure in helmets and, uh, and, and just the dramatic things they're doing with helmets where there is a lot more, uh, not just padding, but there's more give and twist and turn. Uh, so, so all the science is advancing in that direction. Uh, but I absolutely do think, you know, there's going to be a standard uh, a, a, of safety in the future for, you know, high schools, colleges, pro, and, uh, you know, even down to the little league, that if it's not adhered to, you know, I think, and if, I think to, to avoid some of that, you, you know, you see the new concussion protocol. Uh, it's, well, I say new, it's not really new anymore, but it's, it's come to professional football. It's come to professional basketball and college sports. And when someone, you know, um, I can't remember a good instance off the top of my head. You know, we saw so many injuries this year in the NBA Finals, but luckily none of those were brain injuries. Um, but, it, but it's the same thing, you know, guys getting taken off and, and checked. And, you know, and then one of, the, one of the stats that just blew me away was that uh, one of the leading calls or most growing trends, and I know this would uh, mean something to you because of, of your daughters and their sports, is uh, uh, youth girls soccer had a higher uh, rate, uh, like the fasting gro fastest growing rate of, uh, of traumatic brain injury. And that comes from the headers and things like that. And maybe their necks just not being strong enough. You know, with, with, with each generation being bigger, faster and stronger, I suspect that science has a very hard time keeping up uh, with the modern athlete that the average size professional athlete is tremendously larger than they were in the 90s or the 80s would certainly be before that and technology and equipment just seems to grasping at trying to catch up with, yeah. with those limits or the parameters that the modern athletes pushing forward mm -hmm. and, and think about this bernard the, you can't strengthen the brain you can't, there's no workout regimen you can do to make it stronger and less susceptible. You know, it's just, it's that three pound, uh, basically gelatinous tissue, you know, that's, that's inside of a bowl uh, with, with a watery substance. You know, and that bowl on the inside of the skull, it's not a smooth surface. You know, it's got bony hazards. No. No. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's you know, that's the your, your typical concussion when you're, your brain is hitting upside of your head. And another interesting fact, you don't have to have, you don't have to hit your head, in other words, to have a brain injury. You know, there's rotational forces that can pull the axons, neurons, um, and, and tear them and twist them and, and even rip them apart. Let's, Daryl, most recently when my daughter was playing high school mm -hmm. lacrosse, we had one of the better players in a playoff game have a, a concussion. And she ended up sitting basically in the dark for several weeks as she recovered and recuperated and, and bright light just was awful for her. So that leads me to, to talking with you for a second or two about how do you treat EBIs? How do, how do the professionals attack uh, what, what's there? How do they deal with it? Well, uh, there's, not, there's not a whole lot of great, you know, as hard as it is to diagnose, it's, it's even harder to treat because the symptoms are basically all over the map. You know, the first thing you learn is that no, no two brains are alike. Uh, the brain of a 92-year-old a nursing home re resident and the brain of a, a six foot six, 270-pound uh, NFL linebacker are not the same, uh, as their bodies are not the same. So the treatment, you know, the treatment starts with, uh, in, the, in the symptoms, I think, I think we probably need to talk a little more about the symptoms, you know, the, the foggy, the, the memory loss, short-term and long-term memory loss, the fogginess, the fatigue, depression, and, you know, that's one that, that I'm big, depression and traumatic brain injury go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Typically, when you see one, you can see another. Uh, and then, you know, the, we talked about the tinnitus, the, the ringing in the ear, you got their bell rung. Um, 
And so, so the treatment, you know, after you've done the difficult thing of diagnosing it, uh, you know, most, most of the doctors are sending, it, you know, patients home saying, this is going to get better. You know, you got to have plenty of rest. And when you have the massive headaches, there's another huge symptom of traumatic brain injury. You have to treat those with the ibuprofens and the Aleve and the Tylenols. Uh, but there's, there's no, you know, like we talked earlier, there's no like putting a cast on this. It just takes time. And in some cases, as we talked about, that miserable minority, they don't get better. Well, I, I, I know that I've never been uh, subject to a concussion or a, a TBI of any sort, but I've certainly been around a lot of athletes and clients who have, and their loved ones universally seem to share uh, a lot of what you're just describing as symptoms, but also the frustration, the change in personality for a while, the temper due to the frustration. And I guess you treat symptom by symptom, uh, which seems to be the, really the only approach that I've seen. But you're right, it's, it's not like an orthopedic surgeon repairing a ligament or dealing with a, a vertebrae in the back where you can go in and fix something in a surgery. It just seems to be and this is what I want to ask you, Daryl, is from a timetable, what is your experience about how, how long does it take for, for clients uh, to, to either return back to their normal self and be symptom free or realize this is it, this is the new normal? How long does that typically from a timeline take? Yeah, that's a, that's a good word, the new normal, because you know, tip, there, there's a lot of ca instances where we don't get uh, a traumatic brain injury case for a couple of years. And as a lawyer, you can imagine the problems you have with that because this person has not been through a whole lot of treatments because there's not a lot of treatments. And they've been told by their primaries or even neurologists or whatever that this, you know, in, in most instances is going to get better and then it doesn't get better. And so that then then that you know it does have to become that new normal. And a lot of times, as an attorney, if we're not getting these cases to a year, year and a half, two years in, we got a lot of catch up to do, and we've got to go back and find out the treatments that they did, you know, that they did have. We've got to talk to the people who treated them and try, you know, and then a lot of time it 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 comes it it falls on the lawyer to try to help get this treatment. And that's really not supposed to be our job. Our job is supposed to let the medical professionals handle that. But when there's just, when there's nothing you can do, sometimes there's nothing you can do other than the wreck. And then like you, you said, the new, I love that word, new normal. Their new normal becomes a life with traumatic brain injury. And they have to understand that. Their family has to, and, and Bernard, you know that, that, uh, that as well as I do, the bulk of these people, you know, they can't just quit working because of a, a, a traumatic brain. As, as sad as that sounds, they can't quit. I mean, they have to have food. They have to put, you know, a lot of them are, are providers, uh, multiple children, um, you know, to caretakers for their parents. And so it, you can see all the difficulties that goes into uh, into the diagnosement, the diagnose uh, thing, the, the treatment and the, and the care. And like, and then on top of that, as we talked about, the increased chance of Parkinson's, the increased chance of Alzheimer's dementia. Um, so it's a, you know, you see, one one good example is these. What we talked about those football players, uh, boxers, Muhammad Ali, uh, Joe Frazier, those guys that live into their fifties and sixties, and they're pretty. Although their brain may function, their 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 motor skills are gone, and their speech is impaired. And um, and so it's uh, you know just imagine maybe not having that severe of a case, but imagine having to still put food on the table, having to work a forty-hour week. Um, it, it just gets very difficult. You know, Daryl, my experience in my practice that sometimes when these people come to you for representation, they're also coming to you because you may be a resource because this is the type of work that you do. And I'll give you a. a prime example is one of the more recent TBI cases that we handled involved a car accident. Well, one of the resources or things that I was able to provide is one, helping them to apply for Social Security Disability, which is part of my practice, 
Mm -hmm. And two, I was able to refer them to a buddy of mine here in town who has a boxing gym who, and I interviewed Martin several uh, weeks back, he has created this program uh, of training for people who are starting to have symptoms of Parkinson's disease and helping to combat those symptoms. Mm -hmm. so, and, so a lot of times I think, and, and this is where I was gonna go with, with you as, as we're getting close to the end of our, our conversation, mm -hmm. is don't you find yourself becoming a, a resource? I mean, we're, we're it's easy to say, well, why didn't you do this or that? Why didn't you do this preventative measure of wearing your helmet when you were biking and then you got sideswiped by a car? Well, it's easy to, to act like a parent and tell them they've done something wrong. But at the same time, I know that in, in your compassionate way, you're not only being their lawyer and navigating through the legal field of whatever it may be, but I suspect you're also providing some resources to them. And that's what I wanted you to share, really two things, the resource mm -hmm. angle, as well as some preventative techniques that people can really uh, can focus on. Yeah, we, what, what I try to do is educate first, educate them as much as, as possible, you know, that you're, you, you, you're into, you're, it's a whole new ball game now. And, uh, it, and, and as a lawyer practicing, it is definitely, I think, without a doubt, one of the toughest areas to be in because of everything we've talked about today and the difficulty of this. I had a mentor who first taught me uh, his, brain, his brain injury test was, it's going to be the client that can't remember anything. You know, they show up at your office on a Tuesday and the appointment was on Friday. Uh, you, you know, that you ask them to get a document or something for you and they never come back. Uh, they forget phone conferences. Uh, things like that. So it, 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 it's all of those those things uh, that, that, that change. And so, like you said, being a resource, that, that's why I want, you know, I've begun, and I always start out, with, if I'm lecturing or whatever at the seminar, I'll ask the lawyers there, I'll say, look, today is not, you're not going to learn everything. You know, this is not studying for the bar, and you're going to learn mm -hmm. and, and be ready to go take a test. This is the beginning of a study that will last a lifetime. And it will change. The technology will change. Everything will be updated. Uh, the information will change. You know, what, what was it, 2013 we talked about? Concussion becomes mild traumatic brain injury. So everything in the science is, 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 um, uh, is changing. It's, it's evolving. Like I said, the biggest part of our job is to stay on top of that while representing these people. And it's difficult. Uh, it's challenging. It's, uh, you know, it's the kind of stuff that keeps you awake at night, laying in bed, worried about a client that, that's going through just a, a hard time and there's nothing else you can do for them other than their case. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, so the, we just have to, to keep pushing. And, you know, and I think uh, there was a, you'll like this, a Vince Lombardi quote that the most competitive, you know, talking about football, the most competitive games draw the most competitive men because, that's where they want to be, and I think uh, when I, when I learned of this, it's just something something inside me wanted to represent those people. I've always been a you know a David versus Goliath kind of guy, you know, walking over to the basketball courts at seven or eight years old and challenging the big boys, and you know you get hammered most of the time, but then that one time you beat them, that one time you beat them keeps you coming back, and so uh, that's a uh, you know, it's a lot of, that's a big part of a plaintiff's practice, and it's certainly a part of a traumatic brain injury practice. Well, Daryl, I, I can't thank you enough, bud. This was, this was excellent. I, I appreciate you sharing your time, yeah. first of all, but sharing your expertise and, and your, your experience about how to deal with these most difficult type of cases. Anytime, buddy. Anytime for my favorite quarterback. <laughs> well, well, we can debate that another day, bud. But guys, I appreciate y'all spending some time with us. We've been talking with Daryl Dixon from Paducah, Kentucky. Daryl handles uh, traumatic brain injury cases. Daryl, I meant to do this earlier. How can people get in touch with you, if, whether they're potentially a referring lawyer or a potential new client? How do folks get in touch with you? Yeah, just uh, the easiest way probably is to go to uh, is by email. You go to our website, uh, which is uh, forthepeople.com, uh, spelled out F-O-R-T-H-E, um, or you can you can email me at Daryl D. It's D-A-R-Y-L-D at forthepeople.com. 
and I get those messages 24 hours a day. And if you need more information or more resources, if you want uh, seminar dates uh, and locations, uh, anything I can do to help you, a client, uh, or someone who's been injured. Excellent. We'll make sure we put in the comment section to our talk today all of your uh, contact information. Great. Guys, as, as always, thank you for tuning in and showing some interest for Nomberg Law Live each Tuesday at 10 o'clock, 8 a.m. Pacific. This will conclude today's discussion with Daryl, and we will catch you again next week, next Tuesday. I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Take care.